So we're very pleased to have the Robot Chicken show leads from Stupid Buddy Studios here today with us. Um, we have show creators Seth Green and Matt Senreich. <laughs> and we've also got director Zeb Wells and head writer Tom Root. And executive producer. So quick introduction. In its six seasons on air, Robot Chicken has racked up a number of really impressive accomplishments. They've shown us that through fart jokes and montages of shots to the crotch, Woo! you can win, you can win Emmys. Not just, <laughs> not just one, but four <laughs> Emmys. Um, they've also clearly cornered the market on stop motion animation sketch comedy. So name an 80s cartoon or a pop culture icon and they've spoofed it. And most importantly, They've made it cool to be a nerd, validating many childhoods in this room spent on the floor, <laughs> lying in front of the TV on Saturday mornings. Let's give a big round of applause for the Robot Chicken guys. Um, normally, we, we kind of open this stuff up for questions. We're, we're awkward people. So, uh, we're not much for keynote speaking, but we are <laughs> really good at in-context conversations, so maybe. Yeah, if Maybe you guys have if anybody questions. wants to come up to that microphone and ask us something, it'll start us off on a 45-minute rant about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at those. <laughs> How'd you guys start with this stuff? How do we start with this yeah. stuff? What was the, where did it begin? Um, uh, Tom and I used to work at a magazine called Wizard uh, and Toy Fair magazine back in the day. For those of you that don't know, Wizard was the premier genre media. Where, Pre the internet, when all you could do was wait for a magazine to be published to give you information about, you know, pop culture and current events. So, so we were over there, and uh, one day, being an idiot, uh, I had read in another magazine uh, that Seth was a big toy geek and that he customized toys of uh, his Buffy cast members as a Christmas present. And I was like, that would make a great article. I didn't think there was any way I was going to be on that show for several years. And I thought I might as well blow it out on a great Christmas gift this year and then never see any of these people ever again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, kidding, I, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so I ended up uh, reaching out to his publicist. And um, we ended up, uh, yeah, we ended up just talking. And uh, I was a huge fan of the magazine. And it actually bought every episode of Toy Fair from from the time that it was invented. So when I heard that the editor of Toy Fair wanted to talk to me, I was, I was like, do you think they'll give me a subscription? <laughs> Is it true that you almost didn't get to talk to Seth? <laughs> yes, my, my publicist is an excellent gateway. And uh, she, I think she asked what your distribution was. Yes, she and did. she was unimpressed by the circulation. <laughs> yeah, we weren't uh, Vanity Fair at the time. So. <laughs> Well, and, and also, at the time, I don't remember what I was working on. That was like 90. It was like Austin right? Powers and, uh, and Buffy were happening. It was that whole chunk of time where yeah. lots of good things were happening. And she was really <laughs> keeping the gate closed. Yeah, so, but yeah, but he called me back within five minutes. We ended up becoming friends. And then as that stuff was happening, um, and we just, when I was out in LA, we would hang out. Every time he was in New York, we'd hang out. Well, and, and, and in advance of Comic Con becoming this massive commercial event, it was just a, a place that nerds got together and talked nerdy to each other. So Matt and I met at Comic-Con for several years, too. Yeah, and, and it just kind of spiraled into just the friendship where one day he's like, hey, I got to go on Conan O'Brien. I have nothing to talk about. I was thinking maybe we may make a little animated short of my action figure, and maybe uh, Conan O'Brien has an action figure, I think, from like just his show just being silly. Well, I'd always been really interested in both toys and stop motion, and I heard that as a publicity thing, Hasbro had produced a 12-inch G.I. Joe-sized Conan O'Brien toy. They'd feature it on the show and whatnot. And I was getting a toy from Austin Powers and thought it'd be funny if our two dolls like, fought or something. So, so, so the, I, I enlisted uh, Tom and uh, we put something together and literally it was one of these things where we had no idea what we were doing. Um, but as we were trying to figure out how to shoot this little short, Sony Digital approached us uh, before the internet was the internet. It was all dial up and said, hey, we hear you're looking to create content. We're doing this. We're looking for content for the internet and maybe do like four minute shorts, maybe order like six to 12 of these things. Well, so Sony was trying to develop a, a portal destination pre-YouTube. They wanted linear content in a a la carte fat. Who could imagine that that would work, right? So, <laughs> but it was pre-broadband. Pre so yeah, this is 2000. You're, you're trying to watch like, 720 comparable content over a phone line. Mm -hmm. It was just insane. It so. also wasn't Mac compatible. <laughs> That's right. So that is true. we turned in the 12 of these episodes, and then none of us at work could watch them. 
Ever. Online. Well, no, no one on the planet could watch yeah. them, really. But we had, we had, what we wound up with was 45 minutes of produced content. So after the Sony platform failed, we made a deal with Sony Digital to shop that content around. And there, you just have to remember the time when this was, was between 2000 and 2004. And Adult Swim was just forming. They didn't really have any original content. Um, Aquatine, I think, was on. Uh, and uh, it was right when Family Guy had gone off the air. Yeah, it was canceled. They just started re-airing the stuff on Adult Swim. And Fox hadn't picked it up yet. And Seth well, they hadn't put out the yeah. DVDs or anything. Adult Swim had just gotten the rights to re-air the old episodes of Family Guy. And they got such high ratings that it it prompted Fox to release it on DVD. But before that even happened, McFarlane said, you should meet these guys at Adult Swim. Yeah. And at the same time, we had already pitched Cartoon Network, who said it was too old. And a guy uh, named Sam Register there, it was like, pass it along to Adult Swim at the same time. So I think those two <laughs> intersecting moments happening uh, kind of made Adult Swim take a look at us. And um, yeah, next thing we know, we had a show. Um, yeah, it, it, was, really, it, was, and it really was that kind of matter of fact. Matt and I had, had we all had been producing these web shorts, but we had, you know, five animators, and w our, our crew was about 12 people total. And then they were like, all right, so we want you to produce 20 uh, quarter hour episodes. And Matt and I were like, I don't know wow. how the hell we do that. So <laughs> we had to yeah. figure that out in a hurry. Yeah. I'm just struck by how many years it took to get the show on the air. Yeah. And then the second show we did for Adult Swim, we drew some pictures on a dry erase board and said, we think this could be a show. Do you want this? And they're like, sure, we'll order 12 of them. <laughs> well, they learned from that. They'll never do that again. No, no that, that was their mistake. <laughs> but man, when you're on the outside of those castle walls, it is hard. It's yeah. hard to get in there. We shopped it everywhere. Matt and I took it to everywhere from Comedy Central to Saturday Night Live to Mad TV to, um, it was, where else did we go? I mean, we literally went, went everywhere. Did so many meetings with so many people over yeah. those four years. It's all and blurred. just waited for the industry itself to change. Just waited for the outlets to become available. Right place, right time. Yeah. I like that people have to get up to go to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> We're not used but to it. You have to sit there with the microphone. The Tony, the Tony <laughs> Robbins format. So you have a 15 minute show in a world where we don't have 15 minute shows on the internet, which is great. Well, I mean, in the internet you do, but on, on television, that's great. Has there ever been talk about going more? Is it hard to fill that 15 minutes sometimes? Uh, um, in the I'll say in the beginning, we were like, man, if we do a really good job, maybe someday this will be half an hour. <laughs> and now our fear is that it goes to 30 minutes, because that is, well, it's, we, let, uh, we exhaust our, we've, we've ourselves success. and the audience, I think, <laughs> yeah. in well, that quarter we, hour. We've had some success <laughs> producing isolated specials that are 22 minute, 30 minute format. But it, for, for the regular show, there's, there's a, a pace to it. There's a, there's a way that over these several seasons we've found it works best. Yeah, very, um, very early on, the, the head of Adult Swim, Mike Lazo, uh, you know, our long sketches, as he said, played long, and our short sketches played too short. He said, so take your four minute sketches and make them shorter, take your three second sketches, make them longer, and you'll find your sweet spot. So now we find like the 30 second to two minute stuff works the best. And if you lump them all together, it's really just sketch comedy. It's, it's, it's SNL instead of an hour, hour and a half into 11 minutes. But we, but we take extra care every episode. I mean, the whole thing is written sketch by sketch, and then those sketches are organized and rough timings are estimated, and then we put all those on cards and put a big jigsaw puzzle together of what each episode will consist of. And then within each episode, we rearrange those cards to figure out what the, the shape of each individual episode will be. And then once you shoot it or cut it, all that changes <laughs> once you get the dialogue tracks. We wind up cutting half the sketches from every animatic just because it's too much time, not as funny, doesn't play, complication of production, any number of things. So wait, just to finish that, no, we don't want to make the regular show a half an hour. It's exhausting. <laughs> every episode takes like several weeks to accomplish, and it's so much manpower. We just, it's, no. <laughs> So my question is, how many writers do you guys have, and how your writing process looks like? Um, as far as writing goes, I mean, Tom could probably talk about it more. I, I mean, we structure it. Tom, Tom's one of our head writers. I'll let you. Um, we got a pair of head writers, and then some recurring writers, like two or three recurring writers, Zeb. and then uh, Zeb is one. Mm -hmm. And then we bring in uh, some sort of like a rotating crew that come in and out. 
Um, but, it, but it's broken down into sections. We have 20 episodes to accomplish. So we'll break it down into either four week or five week cycles and then we'll have you know, our, our stable writers that are on the whole time throughout the year and then we'll have other people come in for each of those four yeah. and five week. Yeah. Uh, we do, uh, yeah, we do 20 episodes in 20 weeks um, and it's uh, three weeks of brainstorming and then a week of scripting and uh, in the scripting week, we also start uh, culling the herd <laughs> and <laughs> murdering our children. And, that's <laughs> and each other's children. Yes, well, especially each other's especially children. Each it's so much other's easier children. to drown your baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's pretty frenetic. It's, I mean, um, a lot of what makes it to the air is pretty dumb. <laughs> and as an outsider, I would say, oh, that looks pretty easy to write. But it's the quantity of dumb stuff that we have to write. Um, well, and it's also and finding it, that it, right kind of dumb. Yeah, there's a specific brand of dumb. And it also, um, it has to come to a vote. Like, we all have to agree, or at least have a majority agree, that a particular sketch or particular idea is good enough to go into the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. It's like, the, the one thing that's remained consistent is, <laughs> We don't write it for other people, as weird as that sounds. As we arrogant it, as yeah, that sounds. Yeah, we write it to make each other laugh. We're, we're a group of friends that started this show, if you count 2013 plus years ago, and it's just to make that same group of people just laugh amongst ourselves, and if that's the case, we're just hoping people are laughing with us, uh, which is our success or failure that was, with the, that. that was the most right. comforting thing about our first season is that we wrote this show, this idea based on all the things that we love desperately and deeply that are almost too nerdy to say out loud. And within our first year, we were met with a really um, encouraging response from the collective saying, hey, I feel the same way. That commercial totally fucked me up. <laughs> so there was a nice realization that we were at least sharing a sense of humor culturally. And, it, that that Im, Im, encouraged us to go forward. <laughs> I really enjoy the show. Oh, thanks. Thank um, you. I just want, can, can you talk a little bit about um, what goes too far that you just can't put it in, what sketches you're like, okay, we, um, we gotta hold this one. We've back. only had a few of those, actually. Uh, not as many as you'd think. Um, and for, most and, of and it gets in. And not for the reasons that you'd expect. Yeah, um, we had one this last season um, that was, uh, it was a Street Fighter, no, Mortal Kombat sketch. And it was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it's just a, it was uh, Johnny Cage fighting Kano, and um, it was, it was, that was that, right? No, was, no, no, it's the, it's the PTS. It's, it's the guy coming home from the tree. He's sitting with the therapist, and he's like, the voice in your head isn't real. And he's like, I just, I just don't want it to tell me to kill anymore. And he then he, here, uh, kill him. You he, know. he finally goes home to his wife and his family, and they're so happy to see him. And they're like, "Thank God you're cured." And he's like, "Oh, my family!" And then he hears in his in his head, "Finish her!" And he's like, "Ah!" ah! <laughs> Why? Which. Which, it was one of those things where no one caught it on the page. But when and you really when you think about it, the child cowering in the corner saying, Daddy, no, and him going, Yeah, Like they punched the head off of both of them, yeah. And, and then it, we made it silly, like there's a piece of pizza, or a pizza box, and after he's like punched his wife through the chest, and then you see the pizza box, and it goes, finish it! And he like flips the box and eats the pizza. Ah! But, but yeah, when it went through. When you when saw it in animation and when S and P saw it, they were like, you, oh, can't, you can't do this. You we can't. really we don't like this image of a mentally disturbed person murdering their family and themselves. And we were like, I guess I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> but you see in the video game, yeah. he's got this voice in his head, and so yeah. so yeah, that got cut. <laughs> it's rare though, and they give yeah. us pretty we cut uh, stuff long in the leash. room. Yeah, we, and, and sometimes it just goes farther than we want to go, and such as. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of I, like a specific. It's tough. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not as often as you think. What was the one? It's it's always like personal, and I and I guess as as we've all become parents and things like that, it, it changes the perspective a little bit because there was that. Um, what was the first person shooter in the Lamaze class? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That oh, aired. God. You guys <laughs> were on DVD. Couple, which DVD, Call of Duty yeah. was that? Uh, four. Uh, what was the game? Or, Modern Warfare. Modern, Warfare. Oh, Modern yeah. Warfare. So we have this very silly sketch. It's well, a bunch it's, of... It's not, not silly just completely all. random. No, I mean, it was it was yeah. based on an actual thing. On the airport scene from Modern Warfare two? 2. First person two? shooter yeah. game. Yeah. Horrific. You play an undercover officer <laughs> that has to go into an airport and participate in a random yeah. murder plot with a bunch of civilians. And to not blow your cover, 
you have to kill civilians. That's weird in a video game, right? So we were like, what's next? How could they how possibly? How are they going to top that? Yeah, what could the next version uh, be? So we had a guy kicking down the door of a Lamaze class and like <laughs> murdering a bunch yeah, of expected uh, mothers and then saying, it's okay, I'm undercover. <laughs> <laughs> And that wasn't even a network thing. That was sort of was us, us in the room, sort of like feeling a chill in the air. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And sort of one of the rare instances we showed a little restraint. What was the other time? We never animated the, uh, the stillborn baby puppet. <laughs> That's always yeah. babies. You should, it's yeah, always babies. Oh, yeah. It was, um, we were doing a sketch, America's Most <laughs> Tragic Home Videos. <laughs> and so the, the delivery the, the babies, you know, they're, they're like, one more push. And the mother's like, ah. And then the, the doctor's like, it's a, ah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Yeah, <laughs> You know, it's, that'd be a, a very tragic I'd prefer video. we don't share that one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets a big rousing. Yeah. No, one, yeah. no one's ever like, oh, that oh, should have been in the show. Yeah. They don't even applaud our, our ethics for <laughs> cutting it. <laughs> it just makes them think less of us. <laughs> Let's cleanse our palate here. OK. <laughs> um, I know you guys get a lot of big names to do the voices for the show. Um, so do you usually write with like getting people to voice certain characters, or do or do yeah. they say like, oh, we want to be in the show, and then you kind of yeah. make a sketch around write. it? Yeah, we just it, write, and if it's a celebrity, yeah, it's one of those things where our first season we called out a lot of favors, uh, people that Seth has known, um, and we got really lucky really early on. I, th I I really go back to I think it was like it was Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise, uh, Ryan Seacrest actually. Yeah. Um, in the before in like was, our first right like five or six episodes. Of Idol, we got Seacrest to come. Um, Charlize awesome. Theron. Um, um, it was like we had like a few big names at the time who just like then when we went out to other people they were like oh they did the show well then these people will do it and then beyond that once um, the show existed and we didn't have to like clumsily explain the concept of a animated sketch comedy show starring action figures to. A-list agents. It was a little bit better. Yeah. We could send it and be like, oh, Charlie's Theron did this. I'm just saying. Yeah, and now it's gotten to a place where people come to us. Um, and you know, ultimately, when we hear someone wants to do the show, they go on this big you know, sheet that we have of people who want to do the show. And then once we have the script Sometimes written, it happens quicker. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, oh, that's a perfect part for that person. Sometimes it's like, oh, we can cast that person. Or we had an idea that. There, there'll always be that random like, oh, we wrote a sketch about 50 Cent. Let's see if he'll do it. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah. So like, he did, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, but cool like in the episode happened. you watched, it was like John Stewart had mentioned he wanted to be on the show. So that was a perfect example of we put him on the show in that episode because we had parts that would fit his voice. He played voice. Matt Tracker and Serpentor, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Very versatile, that John Stewart. Yeah. Actually, one more question. Um, what motivated you guys to do the Star Wars specials? Like. You just had a bunch of sketches you just put deep, together. Or just... Deep love of Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> we, we went through this long, like, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a time when Lucasfilm would just sue people <laughs> over and over and over and over. In, and in all so, fairness, that's brand protection, and Google sure. can understand how important it is with a global <laughs> brand with globally recognized <laughs> iconography that's almost more recognizable than the crucifix. Yeah. You have to preserve your copyright. Yeah. Uh, that's why people are always using the Goggle search engine on right. and TV and movies. Um, <laughs> And so for our first few seasons, we were like, we can't go near Star Wars. They'll just sue us. And we, we don't want to go we down got, that road. But then and we then, got ballsy. Yeah, we got a little full of ourselves. And uh, we did a Star Wars sketch. First, first was the spoiler sketch. So it was buried inside a much larger sketch. And there was just a moment that was Star Wars. We had a lot of arguable legal framework to make a case for what was very justifiable parody. Plus, Mark Hamill did it, which helped us. <laughs> but it was right, it was like in the very, it was, too, it was that was, first, like that was first season. Yeah, very first yeah. season. So and, then, and then the second season, we ultimately we ended up doing our Emperor phone call sketch. Um, and uh, it, it was one of those. That's really what. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big, better response than that baby. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're less conflicted um, emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always laugh. It, it really was one of those moments where we aired. And it was right after it aired that week um, where the phone rang. Caller ID had Lucasfilm on it. And, and I don't even think, I mean, Attack of the, had Attack of the Clones come out? Um, yes. Attack but, of the Clones did. Revenge of the Sith, Revenge of the Sith had, 
And so we were still the, really. No, it did. Revenge of the Sith had come out. It was this was 2006, so it was right after that. Um, but yeah, it was one of those moments where like, yeah, it was that like freeze we, frame. We and, freeze. Uh, so I pick up the phone, and we didn't have an assistant, and I was just like, "Hi, Matt, Generation Seth Green's office," <laughs> trying to pretend like just in case. And uh, the woman was like, "Hi, my name is Tracy Kenobio," and I was like, <laughs> "All right, someone's <laughs> fucking with us." Yeah. Um, someone clearly tapped into the phone line and uh, created this Lucasfilm avatar. There. Yeah, but she, to be a joke. she, no joke. That's her name. Um, and she is in PR up at Lucasfilm, and she said that uh, George has seen the sketch. Uh, he thought it was very funny, showed it at a board meeting, um, and, uh, and, and invited us up to Lucasfilm to get a tour. And, uh, go to the Presidio, go see LucasArts, and go see all the cool stuff up there. And we were there within two weeks. Um, we had a big meeting with all their people, and they showed us around, and had, we had lunch, and then they wanted to have a meeting to talk about like what was the future. And at that time, Lucasfilm, Far from the decision of May. I, I don't even think they've done Clone Wars yet. Uh, Clone Wars was just starting to they like. Just, they were just yeah, it had an air yet. Yeah, it but had it was an air yet. Still really early, and Lucasfilm was, you know, all effort towards those films, and still not sure what what they were going to do. They were they were trying to find, like, a strong presence for the fan relations. They were starting um, to put more emphasis on all of this content, and they said, well, maybe we're going to do a show that's an amalgam of all the fan content, and you guys can build wraparounds or something for us. And Matt goes. I've got an idea, and like under the table, just sort of subtly taps me, kick, at, like not to say anything. And I look at him, and then he goes, "Why don't we do a half hour of Robot Chicken solely dedicated to Star Wars?" And I just sat there, like, <laughs> <laughs> only one and shot. I wa- and I watched all the people in the room go, "Huh?" And I shit you not, three weeks later, we were off and running on that first special. Yeah, it, it was, was really fast. Yeah, happened. it was really fast. And then even better was in that special. George is like, I'll do a voice. Well, no, that's not how it happened. We wrote a sketch. We wrote a sketch where our nerd character goes to see a Star Wars con and winds up in an elevator with George Lucas. And it was just so silly. And it was just like loving and really funny. And he gets such a, he has such a strange reputation because no one really understands him at all unless you spend any time with him. And we just wanted to show him being silly. And so we asked everybody in the company if he would do it. And they were like, absolutely not. Don't even ask. And we were like, just keep asking. And we finally got it in front of him. And he was like, all right. And it's like four cues. It's not a lot of time commitment. We would come to him. And we got him uh, to agree to be in our show, which was insane. And even more, we got him to agree to do a promo about agreeing to do the show, where he's sitting on a therapist's couch being interviewed. And he says, I can't believe I let the Robot Chicken guys make a half hour special. This is the holiday special all over again. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. First take blew out the mic. <laughs> we were like, the voice down just a little bit. And he's like, ah, sorry, ah, getting into it there. It was, all, it was really awesome. And that was when we knew, we were like, this guy is the coolest. So it's obvious that you guys grew up playing with toys. No. It's totally obvious. What, what and that, tipped you off? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And that even the show now is the toys doing, the, doing everything without you playing with them as a kid. So with the great respect that you have for toys, being Toy Fair, et cetera, what's the chop shop like where mm, you actually brutal, have dude. to get your yeah. you know, favorite things that you've hunted? Not, you get, there's so many classics survive. in the show. Everything is, there ever everything a is time sacrificed to the cause. Yes. That you yeah. just can't. Yeah, you have, you we have we to go, go somewhere else, let somebody yeah. else attack it. We, 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 you have no idea how many things have just been completely destroyed, blown up, victimized. Like, even the action figures that look like we're just using off-the-shelf action figures have to be modified. Uh, Raped armatured. Right. inside. Exactly. Uh, and yeah. then yeah, fused yeah. together to be able yeah. to to withstand the, the our, horrible pressures our, of Our toy wrangler, Hugh Sturbukov at the time, oh. had to get a... Um, classic vintage uh, Vigo Batmobile. First season. And um, ended up buying it from this nice old woman who said it was part of the collection. Please take a good care of it. <laughs> this was make my sure son. Very, yeah, this was. He never opened it. Yeah, yeah. just b- make sure. Still and then, has a sticker sheet. And he tells us this story, we get it, and then within five seconds the shop's like, you know we're gonna have to smash that with a hammer. Because the, like, the gag is it blows up and catches fire, and I get a call, I think I was in Hungary, yeah. and he called me. And they're like, we're gonna, there's no way to save it, dude. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna hit it I with mean, a heat is, gun and then we're gonna smash it with a mallet and this, this it's not gonna survive. A I mean, you can look it up on how much this thing costs and, and literally it was in perfect condition. It was pretty. And uh, yeah, it destroyed. 
I, I we got over it quick though. There still has to be a little bit of that in, your, in, in each one of you. So what went home? What, what a, even after it was in the show had to make it into oh, that? Uh, yeah. Or, you know or that I display have? case uh, that you don't ever want to touch it again, that it's just your... Uh, we, I mean, we've all I've got uh, the show. Right, Brit Britney Spears monster <laughs> in our first season, actually dating back to Sweet Jay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was a, we rebuilt uh, her for the, for the first season. The, yeah, it's Britney Spears grows to Godzilla size, and each of her hands and feet are other female pop stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was built out of, you guys ever been on the mummy ride at, uh, Uni is it Universal Studios? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They sell these giant rubber mummy dolls. Um, and so I bought one and then I donated it and uh, tore it apart. Yeah. Used uh, its basic elements. <laughs> so that's in a place of honor. As a uh, newer employee, I have stolen nothing from the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Anything that would ever get reused in the show is stored somewhere around the shop, yeah. and anything that gets displayed is displayed, but would also get put back in if we needed it. So, Humping Robot. Yes. Uh, what happened between him and the jukebox, and will he ever find love again? <laughs> <laughs> well, they did fly off together yeah. uh, in a grease sketch that the we did. The song said, we'll always be together. Yeah, so I think they're living happily ever after. A, wasn't, wasn't there humping afterwards? Oh, I'm sure he cheats on her all the time. Oh. Yeah. That, that's not a given. A, he's not a one-woman robot. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a character that, that, that's one of those that I always write off as, who the fuck knew that one? It was, like, a, single, it was a single sketch, and it was in the early days of We thought of that was a throwaway, place. silly sketch that would never, and it well, turned into. Well, it's the into, face. It's yeah. that glazed expression that he's got. It's just dumbly humping. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was in the, early, in the early episodes of the first season, we were still figuring out what the channel flips were, and they were more strange cutaways than they were um, standalone jokes. And so we thought the idea of a robot just happily humping a washing machine would be funny, which it was, and then we just kept writing other scenarios <laughs> for him. <laughs> the next thing I think you know, last, you have a... In the last a, season, they just invaded the planet. Yeah, we had a battleship sketch where it was battle hump. And, <laughs> and it was up to Officer Rihanna to save the ocean. <laughs> So, um, you guys not see Battleship? <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to see Battleship. <laughs> Treat yourselves to the Blu-ray. <laughs> More action per capita than the core. <laughs> <laughs> True statement. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah. um, slightly unrelated. Uh, can you comment on the rumors that Seth Green will be in the Entourage movie? In the Entourage oh. movie? Oh. Oh. I haven't heard anything about that. Is there a kick <laughs> is Are there they a really kick making that? Is there a Kickstarter for that? No, I think they're actually making it. I think that's oh. it. I haven't heard it. They wrapped it up so tightly with a bow. I don't know. It's one of those things that might that happen on Robot Chicken this season, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those things that's so, for, for me as an actor, is so strange. Because when I first did it, I thought I was doing one thing. And then over time, it evolved into something completely different. Like, I, I made uh, the Italian job with Mark Wahlberg the year, and then he started Entourage the year after. And so he asked me to come do something, I wasn't available, but Kevin Connolly, who plays E, he and I have known each other since we're seven years old. We both started in New York doing commercials. We actually, if you wanna see something very funny, go to YouTube and look up <laughs> Matchbox Car Wash with both of our names, and you will see a hilarious commercial of like, seven or eight year old Seth and Kevin playing with cars. <laughs> and so we, we're actually like old, old friends and playing, I don't know if anybody saw this, but I play uh, a hyper, super douche version of myself, but on Entourage, it's hard to explain. It's very yeah. bad. Um, Ultimately, he plays the asshole version of himself. And what's crazy is all the people out in the world are like, I can't believe he's really like that. It, it was really Not realizing that it's television. It was a moment where <laughs> Entourage became such effective propaganda that no one believed it wasn't reality television. Mm -hmm. And anybody that appeared on it was immediately assumed to be exactly that persona, which I thought was hilarious. So I kind of leaned into it and just became like as dick a version of myself as I could. Every single scene, sunglasses, texting, like whatever, bro, whatever. And uh, I thought that was really funny, but there was, because I wasn't doing films as much, because I was really concentrating on producing and everything else, there was an entire generation gap of kids who didn't know me from interviews or from other performances. They only knew me from Entourage, and I noticed, like, people between the age, people who were at the time, like, between 10 and 17 for the next five years 
were certain that I was just a motherfucker. And I had, I had like strangers picking fights with me in bars. I was like, what? And they were like, hey, Joel, man, you, 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 Turtle should have knocked you out. And I was like, you know that's television, right? <laughs> but because everyone had really become consumed with the OC and, you know, whatever, Vanderpump rules, like people have just become. Wait, it wasn't real? <laughs> No, Vinny Chase is a huge movie star. Oh, I love the Aquaman true. movie. That was awesome. Yeah. Made $100 million. Cameron crushed that, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't know. The, the, the thing that Doug, that Doug Allen, who's the creator of the show, said to me was, we love this one-off gag, and we didn't want it to become like a mustachio-twirling villain. It, it sort of defeats the purpose of the reality implication of the show. Um, and since we <laughs> made it so theatrical with me and Bow Wow fighting each other in the NBC offices. It just seemed like there's not too far to go. <laughs> I think one of my uh, favorite scenes in Family Guy is when Chris and Peter are making fun of Robot Chicken and like, yeah. going back and forth. Me too. Is there any like truth to how you and McFarland really are with your shows? Like a rivalry <laughs> no. there? Or, like... Seth McFarland and I, I don't know. we love each other. We, we... You know that, that he hired Seth to be on Family Guy. And... <laughs> Still pays him to do that show. <laughs> do that show. Oh yeah, he's <laughs> he's EPing that show that I'm that I'm doing for Fox. No, but but that is it's but, it's no, just it's a playful thing. Like McFarlane, we've been friends since '98, and uh, the Star Wars things just happened at the same time. So we even laughed at one point at Comic Con, like, holy shit, dude! I cannot believe two of the biggest Star Wars fans in the world are getting to make comedy Star Wars projects at the same time. And we were in production at the same time, but ours beat theirs to air. So, and the whole time that we were developing it, we were on the phone with the other writers, like, hey, are you guys doing a Wampa joke? Hey, are you gonna do this Tatooine joke? Hey, you're not doing this Death Star joke? Just to stay off of each other's territory. And in places where we were crisscrossing, we made sure our actual jokes were totally different. So by the time Family Guy was coming out, it was like several months after our, our show had aired, so they rewrote this whole last bit, and I come in to record after I've recorded the entire thing, and it's this scene of like Peter shit talking Seth Green, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I go, is this, is this cool? Is this funny? And he's like, yeah, I think it's hilarious. And I was like, okay, I think it's funny too. So that was it. It was like an inside, ha 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 thing, but people. I think people really I, love I, drama. Just to, just to know history, Seth and Seth used to live four houses down from each other. <laughs> so, like, there was a point where we lived on the same block. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's all in the family. You know, we rode skateboards together in the neighborhood. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> also off topic for Seth, is there going uh -oh. to be an Austin Powers 4? Mm. I, have, I have no evidence to support the yes or no answer <laughs> to tell you the truth. Can either confirm nor deny? I'm, I'm just probably the last person to know about that. I'm probably like number seven on that call sheet, so. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever asked Mike? Um, the last time I saw Mike was right before, it was right before Love Guru. He was hosting MTV Awards and we did a bunch of promos for it. Um, and he was in the greatest like place I'd ever seen him, literally radiating, and then that movie didn't make money and people, people were mad at him and he was like, maybe I'll just sit this out for a minute. Cool. So I've got two actually. Will I be able to buy Apocalypse Pony and what happened with uh, Star Wars Detours? I, okay. I could probably take that. Um, well, Apoc Apoc Apocalypse Ponies, no, but for a very good reason. We spent uh, we at, least, at least 17 months credibly pursuing that with Hasbro and Hasbro Industries and they, to their credit, were really, really, they, they really tried. They but very simply said, you know, the 10,000 or 20,000 units that it would ultimately sell for the geeks of the world like ourselves, you have to remember there are it can't millions of justify. people who, the millions of people who like the brand of, a, of, of My Little Pony, think of all the parents of those seven-year-old kids who go, what the hell are you doing to this pure it was, brand? It was bigger and simpler than that. They were like, hey, look, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are the harbinger of the end of the world for the biblical community. <laughs> so the 10,000 units we could possibly sell for this one-time promotional thing at Comic-Con does not match the Business potential model. 10 years of protesting we could have outside our offices <laughs> for, people, for people that don't get the joke. And we were like, I, I, I totally get that. Yeah. Totally get that. Um, and then detours. It's, it's even more simple than that. When, we, when, when George created the show, there was no plan to do these other movies. And a 
um, a comedy version of the Star Wars community, of the Star Wars universe, isn't the right first message in these next three years ramping up to episode seven. So we've produced almost 40 complete episodes of the show, and at some point, it's going to be seen, especially in this world of new media where we have no idea what the network model is gonna look like in two years, three years, or five years. It, you look at the Netflix model of uh, House of Cards and how well that worked, people buying entire seasons at a time. I, I just expect that, our, that, that Detour's lifespan is gonna start after episode seven, at the very least. Um, and we've never been told, look, we're, this is never coming out. No, no, we've been told not. this is going to be delayed. Yeah. Um, it's strategic and, timing, you know, with, with, a, with a brand that's as globally as expansive as, as Star Wars, it's, they have to be very strategic in the way they release specific information. All right, well, we really want to thank the Robot Chicken guys for coming to Google LA, and let's give them all a big round of applause again. All right. Thank you. Thank you.